Welcome to GM Street, part of the Ringer Podcast Network. It is Wednesday. It is April. It is April fourth, and I am joined 4th. by the great Michael Lombardi. Lombardi, how you doing? Tate Frazier, I'm honored to be here with you. I'm disappointed. You know, uh, Titus gets a tuxedo st- next to you. I get a Charlotte Hornets T-shirt. Like you know, it's like stuff. Don't, it's not fair. Sometimes you have to dress to impress, and I don't do that very often. You did, no, but, I, but I'm happy that I got to wear a tux. I was, that was a little nice. worried when I saw a picture on Twitter. I thought Titus was wearing white socks with that tux, but uh-huh. then you corrected me, so I feel a lot better about it. You it know, was Larry Bird was on the socks, so that's right. why a lot of people thought he had white socks on because Larry Bird, you know, the great white hope himself, uh, on his socks. But you know, Titus was very proud of those Larry Bird socks. So yeah, and you good. and neither of you were able to secure a tie from the great Jim Nance. No, we tried our best. We tried our darndest. Uh, Jim Nance, <clears throat> we were talking about this last night. Uh, Jim Nance has had such a great week. You know, this is this is his time of the year. This is Nance time. This yeah. is when he's all over the national title game in the Final Four. This is these are his many oh my moments. And then he has the Masters coming up. Um, but the tie presentation didn't get the love it deserved, right? I don't think it did. No, I, it really didn't. I mean, I, I was disappointed, and I was I would have liked to seen, you know the. The, the whole thing, I, I, I missed it. I don't know where if, if it was not on or I went to Homeland or I went to a show that too quickly. I don't know. Maybe I started watching Billions. Maybe I just gave up on it. Well, the problem is Philadelphia basketball is too good right now because Phil Booth, another guy that deserves some mic time, was trying to give a shout out and it kind of ruined the, the presentation right. for Nance to give his time. Philly sports is just really good right now. You got the Eagles and got their trophy and uh-huh. Villanova's got their trophy out on the main line. And you saw what Barkley said. Barkley said that it's time for the 76ers to win the NBA title. It is time. I mean, this 11 great. straight. 11 Are straight. you proud? I, I'm 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 optimistically excited. I really am. Without Embiid the other day, I mean, without Sarge last without night. Without Sarge last night, I mean, Fultz is actually back playing. I never thought he would come back this year. So, yeah, I'm encouraged. I think Simmons is great, though. I really do. I think Simmons is great. I he, think he's unbelievable. We've been trying to find the next LeBron James for a long time, and he may be the one that has the physique to be that. Finally, he, yeah. I mean, he's so long. He gets to the rim. I mean, once he develops even a, just a 15 foot shot, I mean, it's really he's kind of like Inspector Gadget with those arms. He's kind of got. It's a unique game. I mean, I'm happy. It's it's awesome. It'll make it'll make playoff basketball around here now fun for me because I I you know in the past you never had that opportunity. So yeah. I just wish they would get to that those white uniforms with that Philly thing on it. I'm not a big fan of those. <laughs> Like I wish it's always a, something, yeah. yeah but but they're gonna, I, you have two backup point guards right now. You have Marco Fultz and T.J. McConnell. That, that's a joy. Yeah, no, it those is are good. great backups. They really are. Yeah. I mean, Fultz, is, Fultz has surprised me how well he's played. He really has. He's surprised me how well he's played. I'm, I've been encouraged by him. I know it's good for the number one pick to prove everybody uh, wrong, um, and that's always fun. But let's talk about. Let's a, talk of Masters. Let's just one thing. Quickly, we, you want to talk about the Masters? I, I really okay. want to do because this is the greatest week of, of all time. I okay. mean, there's nothing. I'm not a golfer. My two sons play golf. They love golf. But I've never been to the Masters because it's always been around draft preparation time. And, you know, I've never really experienced it from afar, from on the grounds. But from afar, I think it's just like it's the greatest tournament of all to watch it. Tiger back this year. I mean, you know, Freddie will probably shoot Thursday and Friday be right in it. You know, We're going to have so many Freddie couples, Freddie you know, couples. Thursday, Friday moments. They got the show. great James Nance giving us the play by giving us the coverage. And I think it's awesome. I, th- I think this is the, this is really I, I hope Mickelson plays the level he was been playing before. And some of those young guys keep playing and Tiger out there. I mean, who could ask? CBS is happy. It, it, they are very happy. There's been so many storylines going into it because all the best players are playing well right now. I mean, there's been leaked reports. You know, Phil Mickelson, I think, had five straight birdies from 13 going in um, the other day in his practice round. Tiger Woods has, you know, now become a 10 to 1 odds favorite to win the Masters, which is crazy. If you told someone in 2015, they would never believe that. Dustin Johnson's the number one player in the world. Uh, and you he's know, never won a green jacket. And he's right? never won a green jacket. And people and have sort of forgotten about him. And you would think he would dominate that course being long. And, I, and what, I, what Nance always told me about the course was, it's more wide open than it appears on television so but you know you would think johnson would do it but look it's it'll be a fun time it's great you can watch it i'm excited for it dustin johnson a myrtle beach south carolina native he is a he is a great golfer i'm, I'm pulling for him uh then roy McElroy's is trying to win his first green jacket jordan speed there's so many storylines in golf it's going to be fun jim nance i'm just I, you told me a story about jim nance having the the seventh hole at pebble yeah. beach in his backyard so in jim, carmel california jim and was I, I just jim's can't. been a very close friend of mine for a long time when we were together at cbs and he graciously he had a home he has a home out at Pebble Beach, uh-huh. which is the, his home, is the greatest place. It's he, the Madison Square Garden of golf. Yeah, and he's always wanted to live there, and he has a beautiful home with his wife and his two young children. And, and behind his home, he has the seventh tee. If you have the watch the commercial with Phil Mickelson and Bones up on a tee, and Peyton Manning comes out in his bathrobe, you know, <laughs> with a cup of coffee, mm-hmm. that's Jim's house. And the, he's replicated the seventh hole at a at 
the pebble. It's, in it's his the backyard. par three that's 90 yards downhill. Right. That's where he got married yep. on that hole. Mm-hmm. So he replicated in his backyard with an elevated tee, and he's got all the balls there, clubs, and you can just sit up. My two sons went out there. You said they were Titleist golf balls Titleist there. Fake <laughs> balls, but they're rubber balls, right? <laughs> Don't want to break any windows. Don't want to break any yeah. windows, and you got the Masters music playing in the background. Uh-huh. I mean, there's really nothing like it. It's it's a day unlike any other. It truly is. Yes. When oh you my. Spend the day, Beautiful times. And when you spend the day with James Nance, that is, and this will be, I still contend he needs to write a, a book about this week in sports from the, the Thursday before the Final Four until he presents the green jacket. There's nothing better. There's nothing better. And we know this week, uh, you know, college basketball is taking your attention. Uh, the Masters will take your attention. But Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots, talk about, talk about that segue right there. They, yeah. they're, they're trying to get your attention, too, because they're I making big moves. I think this whole offseason has gotten everybody's attention. I mm-hmm. think I've never seen a time where people have been willing to trade more than they are now. I, I think there's been more stuff going on behind the scenes. I mean, look. I, I was talking to Gil Brandt when I was driving over here today, and I asked Gil, who's a resident historian of all the trades. He goes back a long, long way in the league. And I, and I said, have you ever seen a player in two consecutive years, and I haven't researched this, so maybe somebody who's listening could tell me if I'm wrong, but a player's been traded for a one in two consecutive years. Brandon Cooks gets traded for the 31st, 32nd pick last year. The Patriots give it up, uh, along with some other things. Mm-hmm. And then this year he gets traded for the 23rd pick. He's gone, you know, he didn't have a bad year, but there's something that I've never seen that before. Like, usually when you give up a one for a player and the player has a decent year, you say to yourself, okay, fine, we're going to go all the way in with this. But I think there's a lot here that doesn't meet the eye. Because you would think that his value would decrease if the team that just traded a first for him wants to trade him again. But it, but he goes for the 23rd pick this time around. The Rams make the trade. They get the vertical threat. We, we remember they lost Sammy Watkins, who they wanted to keep to be that guy. He right. goes to the Chiefs. Everybody said that's all over Twitter. The Rams mm-hmm. get the vertical threat. Now that's perfect. Because, you know, go, do you know how many throws Goff attempted last year over 20 yards? Not too many. Uh, 149. He uh-huh. did over 10 yards. Uh-huh. Okay, 149. I mean, all his throws are under 10. And he was 69 for one. 49 had 1,744 yards. Now he threw six touchdowns, only one interceptions. So, like, for all the talk about having a vertical receiver in the Rams offense, I mean, they didn't really – their offense is screens, play action, throw the ball under 10 yards, bubbles, and Todd Gurley run the football. Now, Mm -hmm. can Brandon Cooks give them that added dimension on the outside that Watkins couldn't give them for $8.5 million? They better hope so. I I think this – I think these trades are a little bit like – there's this – this is way before your time. So there's this guy named uh, – I love when you preface things like that. Yeah, well, I mean, this is like – it's like I feel like I'm – like I feel old, you know, when I start Don't talking about this stuff. But there's there's this guy during the World War II. Mm-hmm. Okay, Diori, I think I say the name. He was a – he was a – pretended he was a Holocaust victim and a survivor. Mm-hmm. Okay? And he pretended that he was – had – three original Picasso drawings that the world had never seen before that the world had never seen Mm -hmm. before but that was what he was able to salvage from his personal belongings and he sold them for a king's ransom to this museum who basically looked at him and said they are authentic Mm -hmm. well long story short this guy was so good of an artist that he could duplicate Picasso and he was able to take Picasso's drawings and he duplicated them on 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 paper that could he could he could basically fraud the art museums and this is where this is what's happening in the NFL. There's a lot of fraudulent things that people think are real, and it starts with wide receivers in the NFL. It's a huge problem. People think Cook is a number one receiver. Mm-hmm. People think that you know uh, other players are number one receiver. They're not. Number there's about three number one receivers in the NFL. Des Bryant is not a number one receiver. I'm just going to break that news to you right now. He's not. He may get paid like one, but he's not a number one receiver. He can't do the things he have to do. And so what happens when we evaluate receivers, okay, Brandon Cooks has 60-some catches. He's got seven touchdowns, average 16. But when he has to get open and the scheme doesn't get him open, when he has to prove that he's the original artist, it's hard for him. And so that's why he's gotten traded by Sean Payton, who's a pretty good evaluator of wide receivers, and Belichick, who's a pretty astute evaluator of all positions. So for me, I think the Rams take something on. I think the Patriots are extremely happy to get to get a first round pick for a guy that they probably felt like was just a little bit better than what they had. And let's talk about why they wanted that first round pick. So now the Patriots have two first round picks, right? Yeah. And now that has led to the story that the New England Patriots are trying to package together a deal to make a trade, a formal trade 
pitch to the New York Giants to get OBJ, Odell Beckham Jr. Does anybody pay attention? A man we call Ferris on the, this program. Does anybody ever pay attention? <laughs> like, what in your mind would ever lead you to believe that Ferris Bueller would be mm-hmm. walking through the – like, mm-hmm. first of all, first of all, let's just talk about Odell. Odell, everybody focuses on what is Odell, what can the Giants get for Odell. That's all anybody focuses on, right? That's all they want to talk about. They leave out a huge portion of the conversation. What is Odell? What is it going to cost you to owe for Odell for five more years? See, people never think about that because it's not their money, mm-hmm. right? So, so this is why I call this the fraudulent case. This is like this artist back in World War II, you know, because you think this is real. You think you're getting a real number one receiver, and you're paying them. So the Patriots. Let's go back for a second. The Patriots said to themselves. Brandon Cooks is a good player. Mm-hmm. Okay, he's a 64 type player on our grading system. All right, he's not an 80, but he wants to get paid like an 80. So I'll find a 62 receiver. Maybe it's Kenny Britt, who had a good year in the NFL a few times. Maybe it's maybe it's Philip Dorsett, who's a 61. But that margin that I'm paying for those guys, say I'm paying two million for those, whereas I got to pay eight and a half million for Cooks, that's fraud. Okay, so this guy's paintings that were sold as originals they look like they look like picassos however they really weren't but they look like them so they're fraudulent Mm -hmm. this is the same thing that's going on cooks is fraudulent at that number that's my point so now odell beckham i'm going to pay odell beckham i'm going to trade two number ones that's according to everybody says adam schefter says he's worth they're asking for that's what's been leaked that that's his value all right I'm traded. That means I'm trading two players, Tate Frazier. I'm mm-hmm. trading two players that are supposed to come in and be starters. That, two starters for five years at very minimum do- dollars. Okay, mm-hmm. very minimum dollars. Okay, the fifth year option. I have the right to to exercise it if I want. It goes up, but for five years, I have an economically friendly contract. Mm-hmm. Two starters, economically friendly. Okay, now I take on Odell. I have to pay him somewhere north of. Sammy Watkins is 16, but I hear he wants close to 20 a year. He wants to get paid like a quarterback. That's, that's what we Because he's, yes. we've all anointed him. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody says pay the man. Mm-hmm. It's not their money, but they say pay the man. So now you've got to – so I'm giving up two friendly contracts. For, and I have to negotiate on the other side And I have to negotiate. And I have to pay Ferris $20 million a year. For, I've got to pay him $100 million. So, I mean, do the math. It doesn't work. Like, it doesn't work. I'm giving up <laughs> – just run the accounting numbers. I, I mean, Millie, my wife, would be able to do this in a minute. I, like, there's no way we're doing that. She would, like, n- not know any of the players. Like, there's no way we're doing that. This doesn't make any sense financially. It's the truth. Like, why would I give up two number ones that I'm going to have friendly to get a number one, to get a receiver that may play five years that doesn't shift the balance of the game? Like, this, we're not talking about getting Superman. We're talking about getting receivers. And that's the point here. That's what I don't understand. Odell Beckham's never I, – I, I would find it very hard to believe that Odell Beckham would ever be able to fit. First of all, to pay Odell Beckham more than you pay Rob Gronkowski? Are you kidding me? Or, the, or Tom Brady, or for Tom that Brady. matter. Yeah. And it, here's, I think, the underlying factor is Belichick is telling the NFL that most of these receivers are fraudulent. They're, A.J. Green's the number one receiver. Don't, don't Julio kick. Jones is the number one receiver. Right, okay. Mm-hmm. There's about three of them. All right, everybody else is somewhere between that 65 and 62 range, the good ones, okay? So if I have one that I can get cheaper, like why doesn't it make sense for people to say, you know what, I can get a receiver in the third round. Ron Wolf made a living on this. Mm-hmm. Antonio Free was drafting guys in the third, fourth, fifth round. Jordy Nelson in the top of the second. Ted Thompson picked him. Like why would I pay top dollar – for a wide receiver. When has this ever worked? Keyshawn Johnson went for two number ones to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That failed miserably. Alvin Harper went from Dallas to Tampa Bay. That fa- Like, when does this make sense? Like, when does somebody say, why would I build a team around a receiver? So all that to be said, the Rams now have invested in a receiver like Brandon Cooks, and they expect this him like- to be that guy. They, they almost made the trade for OBJ. I mean, is this something that's going to come back and bite the Rams? Well, the Rams said, you know, look, they wanted Brandon Cooks. So the Rams, they trade a two uh-huh. for, for Sammy Watkins, right? Yep. Okay, so they lose. And they lose that on that. They when lose you that. The free, and now they lose their free. one. So this is basically the Rams have said, we are going to give up. We, we feel like we can sign any player and we don't care about the economic value. But what the bigger message about the Rams to me is this. The bigger message is this. The Rams are in Los Angeles, and they know it's 19 and 20. They knew 18, 19, and 20. They got to put 
fannies in the seats and they got to sell luxury suites and they got to there's a lot of things that are going into what the rams plan are they're on a short-term basis to win and to entice and build momentum in los angeles as they build the stadium in inglewood and try to grow the fan base with exactly LA. so this mm-hmm. these moves as you as just from a st- sheer football ma- maneuver like to me do i think it was smart to give up a first round pick for guys in the last year of his contract okay yeah you can franchise them but two prominent head coaches two super bowl winning head coaches have traded this guy that there's something wrong here like you don't have to be sherlock holmes to sit there and say oh wait a minute there's something i'm missing what am i missing right like i know the guy had 60 catches i know he had seven touchdowns but when he played against xavier howard in the in the second to last game of the season he couldn't get open you know and so there are some difficulties he isn't like you're taking him and saying wow we got him the saints meanwhile who had him Went to the, should have gone to the conference championship and, game. And may have the best receiver in the NFC South besides Julio Jones, which is Michael Thomas. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. So they're saying, look, we get rid of him. We still have, we were fine without him. We, mm-hmm. we won more games without him. So the Rams are doing this, I think, too, Tate Frazier. I think the modus for the Rams is all about – Star power? Star power. Is that we get Sue. We get, co- we get these big-name guys that come in, and people are going to come watch the L.A. Rams because they want to see the stars in Los Angeles. Right, and, you know, to make money, you got to spend money, that mm-hmm. old saying. And I think that the owner of the Rams, Stan Kroenke, is finally spending money because he was, wasn't ever spending money before. Now $14 million for Sue. He's got Sue on a one-year contract. He's got Brandon Cooks on a one-year contract. Now, Cooks and Goff have the same agent. So maybe they feel like they can massage him to get it so they can get him to a longer term. But I think the fundamental question to ask is not that can you get Cooks to a long-term deal. Is he worth the numbers of a long-term deal? That's the question you got to ask as an executive. Yeah, any you know, some or is guy, he Tavon Austin 2.0? Is he Tavon Austin? Now he's probably he's better than he's Tavon. better than Tavon. But I mean, you've already done this but, where you've invested in a receiver like this right. before. Right now, you've you, you're committed. The agent knows you're, you've give up a first-round pick for his guy. Mm-hmm. So you so know they have a little bit of a bargaining chip. So there. now, is he worth 14 million a year? Does he shift the balance of power from four? Or would you be better off drafting a guy in the second round? who you can grow is be- – like, how much difference is it? Like, weigh it. See, Belichick never falls in love with the guy. The Rams now have to fall in love with Brandon Cooks because they've invested so much into him. And then what happens if, you know, Cup and, and Robert Woods are still their one and two guys next year and Cooks ends up being the number three guy? We're going to have to pay our number three receiver $14 million down the road. To me, they got to have to get Gurley under contract because their team, for all the talk and all the things about Goff, who was the worst quarterback in the playoffs last year, and, and Sean McVay saying, hey, look, that's on me. I didn't do a good job mm-hmm. in preparing for the Falcons. But the Falcons made him play left-handed, and the Rams didn't have an answer for it. And the teams that can take away Gurley and the running game and put the burden on Goff to make a lot of plays, look, when you only throw the ball 149 times over 10 yards, that tells you something right there, right? So, that's look, Sean McVay does a wonderful job. I think this is another lesson. Back in the 1960s when – Right down the street, Paramount Pictures was going bankrupt, Mm -hmm. okay? I think the guy's name was Robert Blunden, owned Paramount Pictures. He was desperate, so he hired a guy by the name of Robert Evans. Have you ever heard of Robert Evans before? Like Bob Evans? Like Bob Mm Evans. Not not the the, (laughs) – There's a great documentary on HBO about Uh him. And so he was, like, never equipped to really run a studio. He was, like, an auxiliary guy, but he had an idea. He knew he couldn't afford to pay for the great Mm -hmm. actors, so he decided to pay for books. And so get the great stories. And then the stories will make the actors. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's the NFL right now. The NFL is there's some great, great players, but there's a lot of just the coaches can make the actors. The coaches can make the players. Josh McDaniels got Brandon Cooks open quite a bit. Sean Payton gets guys open quite a bit. Same thing with with uh, with Sean McVay here in Los Angeles. McVay gets Cup open quite a bit. He gets he gets Woods golf open. Yeah. better than what he was. I mean, mm. there's no there's coaching element that goes into it, and that to me is as a fan or as an executive, you have to decide: was it the coach that made this guy great, or was this guy just great? And I think fans miss that point con- tr- tremendously because they really don't know the inner workings. And that's where things can look fraudulent. That takes us back to the guy that was making Picasso pictures is because it looks real, but it really isn't real. If he goes somewhere else without that same ability to scheme them open, then it's not. Go back to Brandon, Brandon Marshall's 23 catches against the Colts. Set the record. If you break that tape down, how many did he get open on his own and how many did the scheme get him open? Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about it all the time. You know, guys go dick by tail when a guy catches an out against air. Oh, my God, it's the greatest catch of all time. Oh, baby. The, the guy was you – know, the scheme gave him that catch. Mm-hmm. So, stop. 
Do you really think, if you're a Patriot fan, do you think Cooks is better than Edelman? Probably not. He's twice as much money? Yeah, exactly. And that's the problem. And I want to talk about the Patriots and what's real now because they have these two first-round picks. They have the 23rd pick. And now the speculation seems to be that the Patriots want to get a quarterback. And that's a larger conversation about there are now, you know, we're, we're saying out loud, like maybe nine teams. So when the Patriots just said with their two number ones and their two number twos is we're going to be a threat in the first round. And we know Buffalo is going to be a threat in the first round. I think the guy who benefited most from this of all is Lamar Jackson. And you think Lamar Jackson, a guy that's been in Bobby Petrino's system, a guy that has an offense, has to run an offense. I mean, a lot of people, there, there seems to be a perception of him that he ran the spread option, whatever <laughs> whatever you want to say. But, I mean, the guy was a pocket passer under Petrino, you know, had to run a scheme under Petrino. We know Petrino can be, you know, for lack of a better term, sort of an asshole with these sort of things. Not with this sort quarterback. of. You can scratch sort of. <laughs> And and that's you know like he what the system he was under is a tough system so Belichick I mean he fits into the well mold. I think this I think the one thing I know about Lamar Jackson and I've watched all these quarterbacks and Lamar Jackson has the most upside of any of them there's no doubt I mean he's not a wide receiver he can he's, he's more, got a cannon for an arm he got a and you, I could show you 15 throws that are just unbelievable I mm -hmm. could show you five that look bad just like Deshaun Watson but this guy's unique in that sense. But what, what has to happen with Lamar, he's going to red – wherever he goes, he should redshirt. If he goes to one of these 12 teams, he should redshirt. If he get the Cardinals draft him, redshirt him. Yeah, because, have Bradford out there. Have Bradford out there. Because part of the redshirt is you have to figure out what offense you are going to run. Let's hypothetically say the Patriots pick Lamar Jackson. Let's just say they do that. So Lamar Jackson would be the third quarterback on their team. Right. Behind Hoyer. Behind Hoyer. He would have a package of plays that he could run. Dress on Sunday, maybe two-point plays, maybe some things. But they would, it would give them a year to develop an offense because one thing I can tell you with, with a thousand percent certainty, Lamar Jackson's not running Tom Brady's offense. Oh, and by the way, neither is Josh Rosen, neither is Sam Darnold, neither is uh, Josh Allen, N Rudolph, Baker Mayfield. Yeah, yeah. None of them are running mm -hmm. Tom Brady's offense. So whatever the Patriots do at quarterback, they're going to have to modify and adjust their offense. And this year time, as they draft a guy, will allow them that modification. That's what I think. And so Lamar red shirts, and then you build an offense around him. To me, that's the right formula. Say Buffalo drafts Lamar Jackson. To me, you're going to have to figure out how you can utilize his skill set with your offense and then have players around that fit his skill set. That's really important. So once you get Lamar Jackson, you're going to need to get big receivers who have a wide range. Same thing with Deshaun Watson. You want guys that like that can catch the ball with a wide radius. Mm -hmm. you know, all, so now you're building your team. Again, quarterbacks are like baseball stadiums. Once you understand who they are, you build your team around the, te around the stadium. The Cardinals, they run, they own AstroTurf, same thing. Once you get Lamar Jackson, that's how you got to build your team. And I think that's really what's going to happen. And I think that's why Lamar's name isn't popular amongst all these draft nicks. But I can tell you from people that I talk to throughout the league, it's a hot commodity right now. And does that affect Tom Brady in any way? Because no. like – yeah, no. so Brady, he came out that Brady like wasn't against the Pats trading Cooks. Oh, let and me, then, let, can I stop you? Yeah, there? and then you you know the, he has like, no say on that anyway, no, right? No, no, like there's no. First of all, <laughs> the Patriots are going to do what's in the best interest of their team. They're not like calling Tom on the phone. Hey, Tom, what do you think if we trade Brandon Cooks? Like they just didn't wake up on mm -hmm. Tuesday morning and say let's trade Brandon today, <laughs> okay? Like what they did after the off season was they broke down Brandon Cook and they graded him. Mm -hmm. They watched every single play. They wrote him up. They understood what his strengths, what his weaknesses were, and they matched to the dollar amount to what he could do okay and I'm sure Josh McDaniels doesn't want to lose Brandon Cooks I'm sure Tom Brady doesn't want to lose a good player but for the value and what they got they couldn't afford to do it so they move on but they didn't call Tom hey Tom do you think it would be okay if we trade you know uh you think it's okay if we trade uh Brandon Cooks today oh yeah go ahead I have no problem with that come on give me a break and but does Brady handle them using their 23rd pick say on Lamar Jackson does he handle that well because right Brady, now he's in a win now mentality Brady has nothing to say about it. Brady's yeah. about, Brady's about Brady getting himself ready for the season whoever mm -hmm. they draft isn't going to beat Tom Brady out yeah Brady's not worried about it it's, yeah. it's like it's like you know now when you get, we talked about the Masters to start the show you know the the, the water in front of 11 they're all worried about that water mm -hmm. you know Brady ain't worried about any any water in front of him he's just going to hit the ball through the fairway and he's going to make it he's going to play his year and if he plays another year great if he doesn't they got a quarterback there that's ready to play I I, I just think it's really up I think that whole notion when we talk to Brady about it is ridiculous the Patriots are systematic in what they do they wrote up every single player after the season they graded every single player.
and then that money has to match what they do. Do you think if Belichick was running the Cowboys that Des Bryant be making $12 million a year? Do you <laughs> no, really think that? There's no chance. That. There's no chance. There's no chance. But some teams just do it. Do you think Jason Witten would still be – I mean, look, I love Jason Witten. There couldn't be a better better. He's football. a Hall of Famer. It's yep. great. I mean, but it's on the downside. You know, you have to – that's the only way you get better in the offseason. You evaluate the players. You grade the players. You put them up on a board. You say, okay, we're deficient in this area. We need a better player here, a better player there. And you go out and you, you set your team needs, whereas basically in New England they'll do – in order to win, you got to have you, – you must have this, you need this, and you want that. There's three categories. Like, so you need a returner, so maybe you – that gets Portell Patterson. You, you, you must have a left tackle. They need a left – they must have a left tackle. Who's it going to be? So you break your team needs down in three categories. Must, have, and want. And a guy they do want is Gronkowski, apparently. They obviously graded him the offseason. There, there were some rumors and some reports that maybe there would be some trade discussions, but they came out and the Patriots said they have had no trade discussions about Gronk. Look, I think Gronk's hard to officiate, Tate Frazier. I mm -hmm. think he's really hard to officiate, and he's even harder to pay, okay? He's under the category of tight end. He's really not a tight end. I think, this, I think tight ends in the league have really taken, uh, are, are taken a hard uh, – uh, role because the reality of them is like Travis Kelsey and since in, in Kansas City or like we remember when Jimmy Graham was having his great years early on you know they're not tight ends they're slot yeah. they're big inside slot receivers mm -hmm. they're they're matchup guys yeah. and they're mismatch guys and they create problems for most guys and so Gronk is hard to pay like is Gronk worth 14 million a year yeah he is but because he's a tight end that label doesn't go up that high. Mm -hmm. And so that's the problem. Is Gronk worth – I mean, Gronk and – who would you rather have, Gronk or Brandon Cooks? Gronk, of, of course. Of course you would, mm -hmm. right? So the reality of it is is you, know, you got to make move money around. Do I think they could trade Gronk? I think anything's possible. Gronk's got durability issues. He's talking about maybe not playing much longer, all those things. He always wants a new contract because Gronk, like he's hard to officiate, he's hard to pay. He's a game changer. He really is one of a kind player, mm -hmm. and I don't know what you pay him. You could pay him fourteen million a year, and I don't know if that's enough. You could, he's worth more than Sammy Watkins in my mind, and I'm sure he thinks the same thing too. But how do you pay him more than Sammy Watkins when he's a tight end and Sammy Watkins is a receiver? See, there's that fine line there. That kind of what they did with offensive line is they said offensive linemen are offensive linemen, so tackles are tackles. They're not left tackles and right tackles. So they lumped it. Whereas receivers, there should be like almost tight ends are receivers. And those guys should get more money. We, we touched on this uh, earlier. We're talking about Lamar Jackson and the potential for him to go to the New England, New England Patriots at the 23rd pick in the first round. Um, we talked about all these teams that need quarterbacks, and there are a lot of quarterbacks that are available. I mean, you talk about the first three picks could all be quarterbacks. The Jets, who are basically sitting there saying, we'll take, whoever you, we'll take whoever's left, whether it's Josh Rosen. I don't think the Jets will take Baker Mayfield because I don't believe that you can grade Baker Mayfield that high. The thing I think it's really important to understand for – is I talk, talk about this all the time. Level of comp matters in, in evaluating college football. It really matters a lot. And I don't know if I am in a, in a my son coaches in the in the Big 12, so I say this with Matthew with all due respect to him, but the defense of the Big 12 isn't very good. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're going to do Baker Mayfield and you're a Baker Mayfield fan, and I like some things about Baker Mayfield, like if you watch the Baylor tape or you watch Oklahoma State tape or you watch Texas Tech tape, you're really wasting your time because they don't really play good enough defense. I think those teams would admit their defense isn't very good. The tape you got to sink your teeth into would be the Ohio State tape where he played well. But understand that that was the opening game, and Ohio State had no – you know, in college, when you open up a game against a, an opponent that you that's a big-time opponent, you have no scouting with them. So you don't know what they run, what plays they run. And if you watch that tape, there are a lot of trick plays, a lot of different things that they got Ohio State on. Really, the tape you have to study with Baker Mayfield is the Georgia tape. That's the game he's going to play every Sunday in the NFL. And if you're happy with how we played in that game, which I wasn't, then you can go more, move forward with them. But can you pick him in the top three? No chance. I think it also opens the door up. Uh, so if, if the Browns don't take a quarterback first overall, then, you know, Darnold does fall I, into I the think lap. This, I think the two teams now, I think if you're the Browns, and mm -hmm. I think if you're a team with a quarterback, this the Patriots trade yesterday has now made the first round very tense and very unsure because nobody will know who the Patriots like. And we're not, we're not saying they like Lamar Jackson. We're just saying if they it opens like, the door to it that. opens the door. And so I think Lamar may, Jackson may, is the wild card. It may be a knee jerk reaction. Uh, Gil you know? Brand invited him to the comp, invited him to the, to the, to the uh, draft. 
uh, up in Dallas, you know, as a you know, so he's not going to be sitting in the green room very long. So we know Buffalo wants a quarterback. We know all these teams. So there's intrigue, and I think that now at the top of the draft, because the Jets are sitting there locked in at three, you can't really get you unless you get to one or two. You're gonna have these guys are gonna come off the board fairly fast, you know. And I could Mason Rudolph go in the first round? It wouldn't shock me. Do I think he's a first round? No. But could he? It wouldn't shock me. It's another Big 12 guy. Uh, the Browns are hosting Darnold today. Uh, they're hosting Rosen tomorrow on Thursday. And then they have Lamar Jackson scheduled to come in next week. So the Browns are looking at all these guys. They obviously have the first pick and the fourth pick. Yeah. Depending on what they want to do, maybe they take Chubb one and then they wait and see what happens with, you know, maybe Darnold goes two. The Jets can decide between Allen and Rosen who they want there. And then they get their quarterback at four. I mean, there, there's so many different iterations with the quarterbacks right. now and at so, the top. So all the fans know. So every team in the league tries to find out. You're only allowed to bring 30 players into your facility. Mm-hmm. And the ones that if like say if you're in New England, the Boston College kids don't count as you bringing them in because they're within your radius. So you're only allowed to visit 30 kids on your campus. And every team in the league keeps track of those 30 and, and have kept track of those 30. Like I can go through all my notebooks and I could tell you if Green Bay brings a player when Ted Thompson was there, if they bring a player in, they're interested in them, they'll probably draft them. Okay. Meanwhile, there's some teams if they bring a player in, they probably just bring in a player in. They may not may not draft them. They may draft them. So you're trying to find out what you do with these 30 visits is you try to find names of players that are coming on visits that perhaps you don't have on your draft board. Mm-hmm. You could do you know Green Bay brings in two or three of these guys. Hey, we don't have this guy up here. Well, we better do some work on him. So you're looking at that, and you're looking at who they are. You try to keep your list as secret as possible, but the agents let it all out. Cleveland can't wait to tell you what they're going to do. I mean, it's just, you know, <laughs> they just can't wait. I think New England will have you'll have There's a There's no time. smoke screens in Cleveland. They they're not trying they can't to, wait you know, to tell you. They, you know, <laughs> they feel like that they feel like they need to endear the crowd to it. But, you know, Dallas, you know, who they bring in, who they like, what do you need a more physical? Now there'll be a recheck physical probably this week, this Thursday, I think there's the recheck so people go back for more. So you, you don't have to bring those guys in, but if you really want to spend some time with a player, you bring them in, you spend time, you get to know them, you move them around your facility. It ain't recruiting. It ain't recruiting. Now, some teams in the league do it as recruiting. We'll take you out to dinner. You know, where I, where I was in Cleveland and where I was in New England, it ain't recruiting. They're going to come in. They're going to te- give them a playbook. We're going to teach them what we're going to do. We're going to learn what they can do. And it's going to be a full day of work and see if they can hold on to it. And it's not just the quarterbacks that are coming in that are going to be rookies that are being talked about this offseason. We just got a guy that everyone remembers, RG3, Robert Griffin the third. He's back. He's back. He gets a one-year deal with the Ravens to be the backup quarterback for them. Interesting uh, move by the Ravens. Yes. All right, so you got Greg Roman there. Roman is really good at being able to you know, utilize the motion, the movement of a quarterback. And we'll see if, if RG3 can get back to the time when he was with Shanahan in his first year or people have caught on to him. One thing we know, he went to Cleveland, again, Hugh, and enlightened Hugh, enlightened him with, anointed him as the number Huey one. Huey Headline. Guy. Huey Headline. Said he was the number one and tried to run the West Coast offense around him. He's not a West Coast offense quarterback. Mm-hmm. Neither is Flacco. No. But the, the coordinator in Baltimore was a West Coast coordinator. So, to me, it's confusing. I think it's a great opportunity for, for RG3. He's got a chance because – Baltimore, we have them down as a team that could turn a quarterback card in, and it wouldn't surprise us. Yeah, what happens if they decide they want to, you know, go after a Lamar Jackson and they bring him in and RG3 tutors him and Joe Flacco's like a lame duck and he's on his way out, you know? And they pick up a ton of cap room and they move on with their quarterback. It makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, you know, because like I said earlier in this podcast, you have to design an offense around Lamar Jackson. It isn't, you know, you're going to have to design an offense around every one of these quarterbacks. They're baseball stadiums, and you have to figure that out. And the team that does it the best – Again, scouting inside out, not outside in, that's the team that's going to be the most effective. And you talk about uh, scouting yourself and grading yourself and evaluating your team. Jerry Jones came out and he said uh, there was no big gap between the Cowboys and the Philadelphia Eagles, the Eagles who just won the Super Bowl, as we know, um, and they're gearing up for next season and trying to run it back. The Cowboys are still paying Des Bryant $12 million. They still have the Witten situation. Dak yeah. Prescott seems to be uh, focusing on next Prescott's season. I think Dak Prescott's taking the burden for this. They have no, mm-hmm. th- th- Their skill level isn't very good. I mean, they're signing some guys. They sign Alan Hearn. They're trying to make their skill level. If Elliott not in the game look their offensive line is good they signed Cameron Fleming to be the right tackle do they know that New England helped on Cameron Fleming almost every single time if Cam Fleming is on an island over there at right tackle they're going to have to it, they'll learn quickly that that's going to not be an easy thing to do they're mm-hmm. going to have to help Cam Fleming again it's about the, the scheme if they leave Cam Fleming like they left that poor kid in the Atlanta game and Claiborne got six sacks it could get ugly then too so 
I, I think Dallas has to be more honest with themselves. Like, it wasn't just because they had a bad year. Their scheme, they couldn't get open. They had some tough times. And then defensively, do they have enough pass rushers? Do they have enough guys that can get to the quarterback? Do they have enough get way to pressure? And what happens if Sean Lee gets hurt again? Jalen Smith isn't the same guy as Sean Lee. And they lose Sean Lee, the, their whole team breaks down. It would mm-hmm. be like us losing you here at the ringer. I mean, the whole <laughs> thing would fall apart. I don't know about that, but I do like Sean Lee a lot. When he plays, the Cowboys look like a real defensive team. So, yeah, I, I don't agree with Jerry. I think I think you are what you were last year, and I think you have to t- take a different it, approach. It seems like he's still buying into what the team was the year before well, when he, they had the great the, run. He kept the clapper. I mean, look, you know, <laughs> he's got the clapper there. and so he, he's, I'm excited for the clapper this season. I think it's going to be know, a lot of storylines. You know. Yeah, of course. He's, he's a smart, smart man. He's a smart guy. Uh, the Cardinals, they get their running back back. David Johnson fully cleared for team activities, a man that was in the MVP conversation was a, an offensive threat obviously had a had struggles last year but I mean this is good for the Cardinals right they can lean back in on the running game yeah I, I think the Cardinals are gonna be an interesting team to see where they go you we know? got Bradford and Johnson you got Bradford you got they're, they're sort of doing the same thing where we pull in a guy like a Carson Palmer or Sam Bradford a guy that's a seasoned vet and try to get him to run our offense yeah and see where they go with this whole thing and see what it all plays out and how their offensive line can hold up and what you know DJ Humphreys can he come back and play at left tackle I think it's going to be an interesting team I, I, they're the fourth team in that West right mm-hmm. now. I mean, I, there's no doubt. I mean, look, it's a it's an arms race. Seattle, can they come back with it? But, you know, when you look at the quarterback situation, they're the fourth best team yep. just by quarterback alone. Yep. Uh, with the Rams, the Seahawks, and now the 49ers with Jimmy G. It's a, it's a lot Jimmy going on G. in the NFC West. Uh, we're, let's talk about the Panthers, too. Uh, so the – Roger Goodell at the owners' meeting said there's been unprecedented, unprecedented interest in the in, the, in purchasing the Carolina Panthers. Ben Navarro, another potential bid, uh, bidder, came and visited uh, and try, is trying to put in a bid as well. Um, we got the Tepper situation, uh, guys, a minority owner with the Steelers. There's been so much talk and there's so much floating around this Panthers team and the ownership and everything getting turned yeah, over. It, it, it's kind of it's it, it'll be interesting team. to see how long. I, I think it goes. all these NFL teams are attractive. I think mm-hmm. the, the, the 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 salary cap. And the TV revenue and all those things make it a very economically friendly team. And you're, they're going to just keep going up in value. And I think that, that, that whoever pays for it will have a huge debt service. And I think sometimes that's good because that forces you to think outside the box. When you've got bills like Jerry. When Jerry first came to, when Jerry first came to Dallas in, I think it was 89 was his first year there. Mm-hmm. And he bought the team. He leveraged himself to the kills. He could not heat the building. We were in Cleveland. I was in Cleveland, and we were getting ready to play Buffalo in a, pre, in, a, in a playoff game. So we had no indoor facility in Cleveland at the time. So we went down to Dallas to practice outside on their fields, and we used their building. And Jerry literally closed down half of Valley Ranch because he couldn't afford to heat it. But Jerry was smart. So Jerry went to Apex, and he got Apex to give him a million dollars for 10 years, and that took care of Jerry, jo- Jerry, Jimmy Johnson's contract. And he started hustling like Jerry Jones does. And I, because he had huge debt service, and he had to pay it off. And now, look what he has, right? And I Jerry think, World. Jerry World. Now, I think that's what will happen. I think when you pay this much for a team, you have to think outside the box. And it's harder for guys like Mike Brown, who's owned this team and doesn't have a debt service, so he's not that, that hungry or anxious to make much more money. And why should he do it? Because he's already making enough money. I think this will be fascinating to see how it plays out. Yeah, absolutely. And all, all I can ask is for Steph Curry to be involved in the bid. Just let him help out. We need it. Someone in Charlotte. Um, any final thoughts before we get out of here? Do you have a master's pick you want to put out there to the world? You know, I, I don't. I have to ask Matthew, my son, or Mickey. I, <laughs> I, they usually give me the ones that do it. I, I don't know. I like. I root for Phil. I like watch. I like watching. I just like to watch a good thing. Uh huh. You know. Uh, you know. I, I don't. I don't really have a favorite golfer that I just say. I think we just need one Tiger Woods moment on Sunday. Yeah. I'm not saying he needs to win the thing, but I, I think we need him. We need to cut to 13, and Tiger has an eagle putt, and everyone's you know on the edge of their seats, and he may make a little run here, and he just birdied 12, and I, I think everyone needs that. In their yeah, life. I, I think it'll be fun to watch. I think Rory McIlroy will be fun to watch to see where his game is right now. You know, like Spieth. You, Spieth yep. is really incredible, and you know, so I, I think it'll just be fun to watch. I'm taking Dustin Johnson. That's just a homer pick. Lock it in. That's a homer Number pick. one golfer in the world. Getting That's no respect. That's because Tanya brought up Coastal Carolina. That's I know. The Coastal about. Carolina is quite the place. If uh, you've never been there. If you've never been to Myrtle Beach, go check it out. It is the Las Vegas it, it, of the East Coast, uh, yeah. as they call Myrtle it. Myrtle Beach? Is it really? That's what they, they say. Can you gamble? Vanna White's from there. Is she really? Yeah. I think you can gamble, it just not legally, but you can do some things. Wow. Figure it out. Go on a boat. Like you know, I think you go 30 miles out, and you can gamble. Uh, that's the move in Myrtle Beach. There you go. <laughs> All right, Tate Frazier. This has been another edition of GM Street, part of the Ringer Podcast Network. Thank you, Mike Lombardi. Thank you, Tate.